have the compression of the corda equina. So just to remind people, the corda equina is below the level of L2. And then there are different mechanisms for what the compression can occur with. So the most common is actually due to bony metastases. So this causes the, a weakness in the vertebrae, which causes it to collapse. The next commonest are vertebral tumors. So um, extra vertebral tumors, sorry. So tumors which are outside of the vertebrae compressing from the outside. Then we have bloodborne tumors in around 5%. And then least common, but can also happen is a disruption of the blood supply as well, leading to ischemia. And then if we think about the symptoms and signs, so some of them we already saw in the case with David, but pain is definitely the most common. So more than 90% of people get pain. And this is usually the first symptom. So they may have kind of this niggling back pain, which is increasing for around for a few weeks to months. Um, it's usually described as a radicular pain, so that's a nerve root pain or in a dermatomal um, fashion. Key things to point out are that it's nocturnal pain for preventing sleep, that's a red flag. Also pain unrelated to movement and not relieved by lying down. And the pain might also increase on straight leg raise, neck flexion and on straining, so you want to look out for that in examination and history. And then more than 75 percent a percent of people actually have weakness and this is usually symmetrical and it's also progressive and the severity of the weakness is actually greatest with thoracic mets and um, this are this is key for examination so if you have a lesion so a compression above the level of l1 so that's the l1 lumbar vertebrae you um, get increased tone and increased reflexes However, lesions below L1, you'll get reduced tone and reduced reflexes. And then rapid onset paraplegia is actually a poor prognostic sign. So if someone comes in and they've already lost um, function of their legs, then that is a really poor prognostic sign that a lot of people don't actually regain any function. Um, fifth, more than 50% of people have a sensory level. So this is the ascending numbness and paresthesia you need to make sure that you examine them with a pinprick because they might not be aware of this until you actually examine them. And then there's sphincter dysfunction in more than 40%. So this can lead to urinary retention and bowel incontinence or constipation. And again, this is a late finding and a poor prognostic sign. And then investigation. So if people could just put in the chat and if someone could read it out for me, what investigation do you want to do? So we're getting MRI, MRI spine through. Yeah, that's bad. So, so um, before that, so diagnosis is made by history and examination. You don't want to delay treatment. So that was key in one of the questions that I asked. Um, you do want to order that MRI, but you want to um, give them treatment first. Cancer plus back pain have a low index of suspicion for spinal cord compression. It's an emergency. You need to treat it. And there we are with our MRI. So. The gold standard is an urgent MRI. Make sure you say urgent before it. Don't just say MRI, because I've been caught out by that before. Um, it's not an MRI in two weeks. It's an MRI within 24 hours. Um, and then management treatment should occur within 24 hours. So your initial treatment, so a patient comes in and you suspect this, you want to nurse the patient flat because you're not sure of their neurological stability just yet then you wanna commence dexamethasone 16 milligrams daily. Um, that's what it is in the UK. Obviously check your local guidelines. You can also say high dose dexamethasone, but if you know it, then you might as well say it. And then you wanna be arranging that urgent MRI as well. And then your definitive management. So the most common would be radiotherapy because that can reduce any tumors. So sometimes you'll do surgery to stabilize the spine. And then you want to be continuing the dexamethasone, but you want to be reducing that dose gradually um, over the next few weeks. 
And then there are an array of complications that can happen. Um, if I just point out paraplegia, so that's losing uh, function of both of your legs, and that can lead to increased dependence and nursing home admission, and also recurrence as well. So more than 75% of people actually get another spinal cord compression at around six months. And then prognosis, so around 30, only 30% 30 of people will survive more than a year after their first symptoms. Um, so there are a few stats um, to be aware of. So 70% of people have substantial weakness by the time of scanning. And of those, if they were still walking at the time of treatment, then 70% stay walking. If they had difficulty walking when they came in, only 50% regain mobility. And if they weren't walking, then only 5% have a chance of walking. So that's why we really need to just be um, treating this as soon as we suspect it so it doesn't get worse. And then 45% of patients are catheterized at the time of treatment. So after treatment, if well, if they were catheterized at the time of treatment, 80% will stay catheterized. If they weren't catheterized, then 20% like will then be catheterized anyway. Okay, so that was spinal cord compression. So now we'll move on to case two. So case two is Marie and she is an 83 year old female. So Marie presents to Amy with confusion and fatigue. She complains of nausea and hasn't opened her bowels for the past three days. She is known to the palliative care team due to a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer. So if you can answer on the poll again, what is Marie's most likely diagnosis? Okay, we'll end that there. So most of you did get that right. So we're looking at hypercalcemia of malignancy. Quite a lot of you put bowel obstruction as well. I understand that because of the not opening her bowels for a few days, but the key in this question is really the confusion and fatigue and the metastatic breast cancer, which leads you more to hypercalcemia of malignancy. The next question is, she is diagnosed with hypercalcemia of malignancy. What is your first line management? The answer on the polls again, please. Yeah, so most of you got that right. You, um, first line management is fluids. Next question is, so you give her the fluids, two liters of fluids and her symptoms improve. However, she is still hypercalcemic. What is your first line definitive management? <laughs> So by a margin, most of you did get that right. So we're giving solindronic acid. I will go through this now. 
So hypercalcemia of malignancy. So the commonest cause of hypercalcemia in primary care is actually primary hyperparathyroidism, but in secondary care, it actually is metastatic cancer. And it occurs in around 10 to 20% of cancer patients. The most common cancers for it to occur in are squamous cell carcinomas, especially lung, breast, prostate, kidney, and myelomas. So the pathophysiology, there are a few different mechanisms that are causing this hypercalcemia. So one is solid tumors secreting parathyroid hormone related protein. So this stimulates osteoclastic bone resorption. So basically it's causing your bones to release more calcium into your blood and also enhances renal tubular calcium resorption. So in your kidneys, you're also absorbing more calcium. Um, number two is solid tumors secreting transforming growth factors. So there's two different types. So TGF alpha is a potent bone resorber. So again, you're releasing more calcium from your bones into your blood. And then TGF beta enhances production of um, parathyroid hormone related proteins. So that kind of goes back to point one and does the things there. And then number three is because of bone metastases and osteoclast activating factors, which increase the activity um, of like your bone resorption again. So this occurs in 20% of hypercalcemia of malignancy. And then there are some rarer causes, which you don't really need to know, but they're there if you want to look at them. And then the symptoms and signs. So how people like to kind of remember this may be bones, stones, groans, and psychic moans. So bones would be your bone pain. Stones would be your renal stones. Groans would be your GI symptoms, so like your nausea, your constipation, and psychic moans would be your neurological symptoms, so like your confusion, your psychosis. Um, there are some other symptoms, so generally, so pain you've kind of spoken about, it can also be weak and drowsy. Um, these patients are usually really dehydrated, so then they're excessively thirsty and also pass more urine as well, so that's polyuria. Um, because of the electrolyte abnormality, you're at risk of cardiac arrhythmias. Neurological symptoms, so fatigue, lethargy, confusion, even a coma. And then your GI symptoms, so anorexia, nausea, vomiting, constipation. And then your investigations, obviously you want to do a blood test to check for the calcium levels. So the definition of a hypercalcemia of malignancy would be a corrected calcium, so that's your free ions, of more than 2.6 millimoles per litre with symptoms. It, you also want to do a, an ECG because of that risk of arrhythmias because of the electrolyte abnormality. And then, like we said in the case, your the main the first thing that you want to do is give fluids. You want to give lots of fluids because these patients are really dehydrated. So you'd give one to three liters. Um, follow your guidelines, but one to three liters of normal saline. So that's zero point nine percent sodium chloride, IV over twenty four hours. So this is mainly just to correct the dehydration, it does lead to a small reduction in calcium because of the dilutional effects. And also PTH acts in the kidneys to exchange sodium for calcium as well. But to correct, to actually correct the calcium levels, you want to be giving IV bisphosphonates. So the bisphosphonate of choice would be IV zolindronic acid usually four milligrams over around 30 minutes. You can give more if, they're, if they have um, resistant hypercalcemia. So how bisphosphonates work, they're a potent inhibitor of bone resorption. So again, it's stopping that, um, the release of calcium from the bones. It's also renally cleared. So you do need to be aware of this in renal impairment. So if your patient has a creatinine if over 400, you need to, um, you, don't want to be given this, you want to be given something else. It, you do need to be aware that it has a delay of around 
uh, one to two days before it actually starts to work and has max effects in around five to seven days. So you want to be waiting five to seven days before you either give any more uh, medications or recheck their calcium. And then a question for the chat. Does anyone know any kind of adverse um, effects from bisphosphonates? We've got stunned silence. Oh no, um, they're coming up. Pathological fractures, osteonecrosis of the jaw, esophagitis. Yeah, that's great. Um, so ones that they do like is definitely that osteonecrosis of the jaw, which actually isn't that common. Um, also the nephrotoxicity because it is renal and cleared and you can also get a febrile reaction. Obviously there are also the GI side effects um, and that's why you've got to take it so strangely when it, it's oral um, bisphosphonates. And then aside from that, you just want to manage their symptoms. So if they're nauseous, you can give haloperidol haloperidol. So haloperidol is actually the antiemetic that you'd want to give for any electrolyte um, abnormality induced nausea. It could also help with the psychosis symptoms as well if they have those. And then constipation, you can choose a laxative for that. And then com so recurrence hour resistance is actually pretty common, which is quite um, which isn't great. If that happens, then you, there's an array of drugs that you can try, which I've put here. And um, I won't go through them all, but I did want to highlight denosumab. So this is something that if they have poor renal function and so they can't have um, the bisphosphonates, then you can be using denosumab because it's not renally cleared. Um, yeah. And then prognosis. So. Prognosis is poor, sadly. So if they've got this, then usually it's around three to four months um, that they have to live. Only 20% are alive at one year. If they have resistant hypercalcemia, prognosis is even worse, maybe weeks, even down to days. And then, like I said, recurrence is common. So you want to be checking their calcium every three to four weeks following this. So. Yeah, so that's hypercalcemia. So now on to case three. So this is Yasmin. She's a 72 year old female. So Yasmin presents to Amy with breathlessness. She has a 40 pack year smoking history and is under investigation for hemoptysis and weight loss. Recently, Yasmin has noticed a swelling of her face and her arms, and she has a past medical history of COPD. On examination, you notice prominent veins on her chest and her neck. Um, what is Yasmin's most likely diagnosis? stop that there. Great. So yeah, most of you did get that right. And um, so superior vena cava obstruction is the most likely diagnosis from this history. So the things that point that out is the breathlessness, smoking history, hemoptysis and weight loss makes it kind of sound like she's under investigation for some kind of lung cancer. And then key for this diagnosis is the swelling of her face and arms and also the prominent veins on her chest and her neck. So next question, you suspect superior vena cava obstruction, which investigation would be most useful? Um, okay. 
So most of you did get that right. So CT chest with IV contrast. I'll go through why it's not the others um, later when we go through it. So next question is, so Yasmin is diagnosed with SVC obstruction. What is your immediate management? more seconds. Okay. Quite a split there. So your immediate management would actually be high dose dexamethasone again. Um, I will go through that now. Well, after one more question, sorry. So Yasmin is prescribed 16 milligrams dexamethasone daily and her symptoms improve. Now, what is your long-term management to prevent reoccurrence or your first line? Uh, so most people did get that right. So in superior vena caval stent. So if we go through that now, so a bit of epidemiology to start. So this occurs in a less than 3% of cancer patients and the mechanism underlying it is usually a compression of the superior vena cava by lung tumors or mediastinal lymph nodes. The most common cancers for this to occur in are bronchogenic cancers or can also occur in lymphomas, breast cancer and germ cell cancers as the second commonest. There are also some benign causes, so you could get a thrombus, so a clot in the SVC, also a pacemaker obstructing it or inflammatory causes as well. So the symptoms and signs, there are a whole array, so these are more these are kind of due to the fullness in the head because um, the blood can't actually drain from the head and neck back down into the atria. So um, you're all congested up there. So they get these headaches, which are usually early morning, a feeling of fullness in the head as well, difficulty breathing. And then I'll highlight stridor. So stridor is the harsh inspiratory noise that you get due to some kind of obstruction in the upper airways. And this is because of the vocal cord edema, again, because you're just kind of swollen up in the head and neck area. And then some signs. So you get upper body edema. So that's what our patient had. And you can also get distended collateral thoracic veins on the chest wall and abdomen. So this is a picture of what it could look like. So this is because because the uh, blood can't drain back down to the heart through the vena cava, it's trying to find some other kind of route to get there. So this is why you get those um, distended collateral veins because they're full of the blood from the head and neck. You can also get facial congestion, periorbital edema. So a picture of it there, all these pictures are from Google, by the way. And then you can get Pemberton signs. So this is the question for the chat again. So does anyone know what this is or how you test for it? Uh, Pemberton sign is that when you ask the patient to raise his ha uh, hands above the head, uh, there is a facial congestion uh, after one minute, which you look for and you look for facial congestion. And it is also positive in retrosternal thyroid. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. So um, any cause of SVC obstruction can cause this really. And this is a picture of it there. So 
what you described very well. You, the patient raises their hands above their head and then you get this facial plethora, which is a pooling of blood and congestion in their head and face. It's actually really distressing for the patient. So you don't really want to be doing this for too long, but it's a test that you can do to check for it. And then investigation. So this was in one of the questions. So the most useful would be an urgent CT chest with IV contrast. If the patient can't take um, IV contrast because they're allergic or renal impairment, then they can go for an MRI instead. So this is most useful because it can show the location and the extent of the obstruction and also the mechanism of occlusion. You can do a chest x-ray as well, that might show mediastinal enlargement, and also you can do venography as well. But again, you don't really want to be delaying management. So if you're waiting for this CT, you do want to be treating it in the meantime. So again, your treatment is dexamethasone 60 milligrams per day. You can also treat the symptoms. So for pain, you can give analgesia, shortness of breath, maybe something like an opioid if they need it. And then long-term management. So to prevent recurrence, you want to be putting in an intraluminal stent, but you can also treat the tumors. So radiotherapy can do that or chemotherapy if it's a chemosensitive tumor causing it. Or if there was a clot that was causing it, then you would want to probably do thrombolysis with alteplase. So it depends on the cause really but the key would be an intraluminal stent to prevent recurrence. And that's the most common thing that's given in the UK anyway. Okay, so case four is Simon, who is a 32 year old male. So Simon presents to you with a fever of 38.3 degrees. He is undergoing chemotherapy for acute lymphoblastic leukemia and, la and his last treatment was five days ago. He has no other symptoms and his other vital signs are normal. So again, on the poll, um, what is Simon's most likely diagnosis? Couple more seconds. We'll end it there. That. So most people got that right. So neutropenic sepsis is what we're thinking of here. So again, key things from the history, a fever of 38.3 degrees. He's had recent chemotherapy and also he has ALL, which is a high risk cancer for this. He also has no other symptoms, so that's also pretty key in this, and I'll go through why um, now. So neutropenic sepsis, so this is the most common life-threatening complication of cancer therapy, and it's a time-critical emergency. So again, you want to have a low index of suspicion. It's usually chemotherapy related, but it can also occur due to bone marrow suppression from the disease process itself. And there is a definition for it. So a bit of a mouthful, you can look at this later, but it's a single oral temperature of more than 38.3 degrees or a temperature of more than 38 sustained over one hour with an absolute neutrophil count of less than 500 cells per microliter. Yeah. And then symptoms and signs. So Quite a lot of patients actually don't show your typical signs of sepsis or infections. Some people actually only just have a fever and this is because of a decreased inflammatory response because they're on chemo, they may have a hematological malignancy so they might not have their white cells working as they should. Some patients might actually not have a fever at all so you want to have a low index of suspicion again. <laughs> um, so if they do have symptoms, so they may have pyrexia, so that's just the fever, rigors, 
they may have some signs of infection, they may have tachycardia or hypotension, or they may just have an unexplained clinical deterioration as well. So if you're thinking, oh, why is this patient not doing as well as they could, then have this in the back of your mind. And then to hone in the point even further, recent chemotherapy plus temperature, think neutropenic sepsis, obviously it might not be, but you want to have a low index of suspicion for it. And then management, how would we want to go about manage, uh, managing this? So just a question for the chat. Straight in there, we've got sepsis six. <laughs> nice one. So yeah, immediately transfer them to hospital because they need the sepsis six and they need that within one hour. So another question for the chat, what is included in the sepsis six? We've got um, antibiotics within the hour, blood cultures, take three, give three, fluids, oxygen. Yeah. Lactate. Yeah. You're an output. I think between them, they've got yeah. everything. I think they've all been said, fab. Okay. So yeah, that's all right. So like someone said, give three and take three. It's a great way to remember it. So the three things that you want to take from them are blood cultures, lactate and urine output. And you want to give IV antibiotics, IV fluids and oxygen. So another way to remember this is buffalo. So it's a mnemonic that you can use. So B for blood cultures, U for urine output. So you want to insert this catheter and check hourly and um, their levels hourly really. You want to give fluids. So this is an emergency. So you're giving 500 milliliters of normal saline over 15 minutes. You and reassess, of course. And A is for antibiotics. So you don't you don't want to wait until the blood cultures come back. You want to be giving them antibiotics. So you'll give them broad spectrum antibiotics. Sometimes in neutropenic sepsis, a cause isn't even found. So you want to cover an array of things, things like tazosin. There's quite a lot that you can give, so look at your local guidelines. Um, measure serum lactate and then oxygen. Again, it's an emergency, so you want to be giving 15 litres of oxygen via a non-rebreather mask and maintain their SATs between 94 and 98%. Okay. So now we're on to case five. So this is Olu, who is a 82-year-old male. Um, so Olu has a history of metastatic bowel cancer and you witness him collapse in his bedroom. He's bleeding profusely from the ma his mouth. So this is just a question for the chat really. So what do people think has happened here? Upper GI bleed, someone's saying. Got lots and lots of GI bleeds coming up. Yeah. Um, fab, great. Um, and so what do we want to do? A to E assessment. Yeah. Someone's also saying we want an endoscope in there. Okay. So, and, and a has blood score. This, yeah, that's fine. Um, so there's just a reminder that this is obviously a palliative emergencies talk, but so what he's had here is a major hemorrhage, which is a end of life terminal event. So it's rare, a rare but frightening terminal event, um, but death is pain-free and quick. So usually the patient actually doesn't have any time to be aware of this or afraid of it. And it can happen in around six to 10% of patients with advanced cancer. So high risk cancers include bronchogenic cancers with hemoptysis. Um, it's kind of any cancer that's around a major artery, so also head and neck cancers if they're near the carotid, and hematological malignancies because you don't have, you may not have your clotting factors, you may not have your platelets to be able to form a clot. And then there's also some risk factors outside of that, so they're kind of linked to um, bleeding as well, so co any coagulation disorders, any liver disease and medications as well. So your NSAIDs, your anticoagulants and your steroids. And then your management. Obviously, if this is a palliative patient, then 
um, if you know that they, they are at risk of this, you might not actually need to do your A to E assessment. So it's all about planning ahead, really. So you want to discuss the risk with the patient and the family because it can be very distressing for the family at the time. It's pretty horrific. Um, you want to be documenting their resuscitation st status. So if they have a do not resuscitate form in order, then you want to make sure that's documented and any advanced decisions the patient has for where they want to be. You want to be reviewing their medication. So the things that make this more at risk, like your NSAIDs, your anticoagulants, your steroids, you might want to consider stopping those if you can. And then there are a few things you can do to try and reduce the risk, but there um, isn't there isn't actually much evidence for these. So things like tranexamic acid you can give, but you want to avoid this in bladder tumours due to the risk of clot retention in the catheter. Also sucralfate and dressings and laser treatment as well. And then you want to do some preparations in the home as well. So you want dark towels to soak up any blood and dark sheets just so it's kind of less unsightly. You want to give a prescription for midazolam 5 to 10 milligrams. This can be IM, buccal or, or intranasal. And um, so that's um, not that's kind of give that's just given. So if this patient is having this major bleed, then the, if there's time, the family can give it just or the carer can give it just to relax the patient, but only if there's time. And then you want to make sure that the relative and carer are aware of who to call if this happens. But the most important thing is just to remain calm, stay with the patient and give midazolam if there's time and support the family to deal with the aftermath. This is a terminal event. So if they've got an advanced decision and they don't want resuscitation, you don't want to be sticking tubes in them. You don't want to be like um, kind of manhandling them, I guess, or trying to do CPR or anything. You just want to stay with them, stay calm and help them through it. Okay, so um, there's no more cases. I'm just going to quickly talk through seizures and tumor lysis syndrome because you don't need to know these in as much detail, but you do need to be aware of them. So seizures, so these can occur in primary brain tumors, but also in metastases. And it's important to know which cancers are more likely to metastasize to the brain. So breast is very likely, also lung, melanoma, and renal. And then the seizures that occur, they're, they're usually partial seizures, plus or minus generalization, and they're usually resolved in less than a minute. And then management. So you want to be starting anticonvulsants after the first seizure. So this is different to maybe normal seizures, which aren't related to cancer. You might, you don't always start anticonvulsants after the first one, but in brain tumors or brain mets, then you do want to. You want to be giving them dex, dexamethasone 60 milligrams daily. But what we do want to be aware of is a reaction with phenytoin. So that is an enzyme inducer. So it accelerates the metabolism of dexamethasone. So which means that it's um, metabolized quicker. So it works less. So you may want to double the dose of dexamethasone, but obviously consult your seniors. And also dexamethasone can also affect the levels of phenytoin. So you really want to be reviewing that. You want to remove harmful objects while they're having the seizure and teach family how to put them in the recovery position after the seizure. If the seizure doesn't resolve after a minute, you can give diazepam 5 to 10 milligrams PR. So that's per rectum. You can also give, well, not together, but you can give midazolam 5 to 10 milligrams IM or 2.5 to 5 milligrams buccal. If it persists, then you can repeat that. If it still persists after you've repeated it, then you may need to admit the patient for IV treatment. And then you want to be reviewing their anticonvulsant medication if it's not seeming to keep these at bay. And then seizures in the terminal phase. So this is when they're unable to manage oral anticonvulsants. So then you'll want to set up a syringe driver. So CSCI just stands for continuous subcut infusion. So you want to put midazolam in the syringe driver, um, 20 to 30 milligrams per 24 hours. 
if that's not keeping it, it the seizures at bay, then you can try adding phenobarbital as well. And then in this terminal phase, you want to be discontinuing the dexamethasone unless they have symptoms of rage in intracranial pressure. So like headaches, nausea and vomiting. And then acute tumor lysis syndrome. So this is the last one we'll go to before the quiz um, where I've got 10 questions. So pathophysiology is it's defined as a combination of metabolic and electrolyte abnormalities occurring spontaneously or following the initiation of cytotoxic treatment in patients with cancer. So it's characterized by excessive cell lysis and it's most commonly associated with kind of highly proliferative bulky or chemosensitive malignancy. So these are things like lymphomas or leukemias. And there are some other risk factors. So if they've had recent chemotherapy, you might want to be thinking this, if they have renal impairment or if they're dehydrated. So there are some definitions for it. So laboratory tumor lysis syndrome is characterized by any two of hyperuricemia, so that's too much uric acid, hyperphosphatemia, hyperkalemia, and hypocalcemia, and then clinical tumor lysis syndrome. So this is laboratory tumor lysis syndrome with any of increased serum creatinine, cardiac arrhythmias, seizure activity, or sudden death. There are lots of symptoms and signs. So these are just due to the electrolyte abnormalities. So things like nausea and vomiting, muscle weakness, paresthesia, you can look at them in your own time. And then prophylaxis. So to prevent this happening, in high-risk patients, does anyone know what we might want to give them? And you can put it in the chat or speak. Someone said allopurinol. Someone said um, IV, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, um, rasburicase. Yeah, that's great. They're both great. And but that someone's popped in steroids as well. <laughs> it's always steroids uh, not this time there <laughs> so um so in if they're a low risk patient so they don't have one of these bulky um cancers then you just want to be regularly monitoring because anyone is at risk of this of this and assessing them intermediate risk patients you want to be giving them iv hydration because dehydration can exacerbate this or cause this to happen and yes we can give oral allopurinol allopurinol during their chemotherapy cycles. And then if they're a high risk patient, so these really bulky like lymphomas and leukemias, then again, IV hydration, but then we want to give IV allopurinol or IV rasburicase. And you want to be given that immediately prior to or during the first days of chemotherapy. One thing to note is that you don't want to give these two drugs together because it can reduce the effect of rasburicase working. And then in the acute management, it's just kind of based on treating the um, either the complications or the electrolyte abnormalities. So you want to treat the arrhythmia or seizures. You can do that with IV calcium gluconate. You want to fluid resuscitate them. You want to give them resburicase for their hyperuricemia. Um, you can give them calcium gluconate 10% for their hyperkalemia. You can give them phosphate binders for their hyperphosphatemia. And then if they've gone into an AKI, you may need dialysis for these patients. Bob. Yeah, so that's the end of me talking at you. Um, there are now 10 questions um, to kind of consolidate everything that we've learned today. Again, like you've done before, if you could just answer them on the poll. Um, if you do need to leave, please fill in the feedback before you do. And yeah, I'll make a start. <laughs>